Welcome back, baseball family. Um, Jason and I are going to go ahead and wrap things up. Sorry, Jason, I almost called you Briggs. There. <laughs> I wish I was as handsome with a full head of hair like Briggs. So I'm I... so jealous of his salad, like so much. It's it's bad. That it's is bad just cause... it's beautiful hair. <laughs> <laughs> he he could be is, in commercials with that hair, honestly. He could. It is flowing and lethal. All right. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so Jason and I are going to go ahead and wrap up the 2021 MLB season. Um, we're going to talk about surprises, letdowns, uh, some of our favorite moments, and really just anywhere else this conversation tends to take us. So, Jason, what was your biggest surprise this season that you saw? Um, my 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 annoyance with their fan base, notwithstanding. I was, I was really surprised by the Nats fire sale because they still had that core unit from 2019 that won a World Series. Mm-hmm. That blew me away. I was really surprised by that too. I couldn't believe it. Like at the trade deadline, just like so and so traded from the Nats. So and so was like, you serious right now? Like I know they weren't winning, but still, like you're gonna trade Trey Turner for that and Max Scherzer. Like I get Scherzer. But still, you're trading away Trey Turner for that? That dude is a top three shortstop, second baseman, whatever position. Top three infielder (laughs) in Major League Baseball. Right? (laughs) You can put him at short and second base and he'll be top three. He's that good, especially offensively. I mean, he's hit for the cycle three times in his career. Come on. like. No, that that blew me away. And again, I'm not a fan of the the Nats, but objectively looking at it, they still had... I mean, outside of Rendon, they had that 19 team still. Yeah, they did. They did. And I would be really upset if I was a Nats fan, for sure, because it they just gave up on the season at that point. And not just gave up on this season, they gave up on next season as well. Uh, you know, you still got Juan Soto, which is an excellent centerpiece. But as we know, baseball is not a one-man sport. Juan Soto is not going to win you a World Series by himself. As, as close as he can get you there, um, batting – 340 you know <laughs> and, and being on the verge of on, on the verge of being an mvp he'll do everything he can to get you there but he's not gonna be able to do it by himself because that's just how baseball works so right. that's yeah that was crazy that was a big surprise i didn't even think about that until you said it though um because my biggest surprise honestly was the giants the entire season and i've said this a bunch of times this year i'm i just kept saying i'm waiting for them to fall off i'm waiting for them to fall off and they didn't until the ALDS when they played the Dodgers. And even then, it took seven games and a really crappy call. Or sorry, five games and a really crappy call to end their season. Oh, and here's the thing. The Giants made some smart moves at the trade deadline to enhance that team. I, I think getting getting Brian at the trade deadline from the Cubs during their fire, they're, they're an unsurprising fire sale. Sorry, Denise. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, he, it was a smart move to get him based on his, his, his experience, mm-hmm. uh, that, that, bo- that, that boosted that team's abilities just mentally because he was there and he could help those guys get there. Yep. And I, I can't believe either what the giants have said about Chris <laughs> Bryant. They weren't impressed with his defense and center field, right field in the third base. And they don't think his swing is going to age. Well, to me, that's like justifying breaking up with the, with a girl who's like awesome. <laughs> you know, like her ponytail some days is like a little bit off. And then like, I don't think she's going to age. Well, it's like, dude, 20 years, she's going to be bomb. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're going to be at your high school reunion and be like, why? What did I do? <laughs> I mean, the rumor I'm hearing is he's going to end up with the Phils. That would be cool. Him, um, him and Sterling Marte are the, are the big gets for the Phils is the rumor I'm hearing. Oh, my gosh. I want Sterling Marte so bad in Seattle. Like, I know that that Seattle outfield, I've said it a lot, is getting super crowded with, like, talent and potential and everything. But I feel like if that team's going to win the World Series – in 2023 like i think they do uh they might need to bring in (laughs) they might need to bring in a vet and i think Marte could be one of those guys because that dude is consistent and all he does is hit he's so good he he was awesome he balled out with a's well if it makes you feel better in two years after he's been with the fills and his swing falls off and 
then Philadelphia's completely disgusted with him. He's going to go get signed by the Mariners and have a career season. And no, he'll that, forget how to hit when he goes works. to Seattle. <laughs> Everybody forgets how they how to hit when they get to Seattle. I don't know what it is. It's weird. But no. this is like the hating on our own team episode. That's really what it's become. <laughs> <laughs> it's this is the, it's like it's such like the it's the weirdest thing. Like Adrian Belte Adrian Beltre came to Seattle. I believe it was from L.A. from the Dodgers. And he straight up forgot how to play baseball. Like, like he was a fine third baseman. He was a decent hitter, but he was not the guy he was who before he got there. Jack Wilson, who was a really good defensive third baseman, got to Seattle and hit like a buck 25 for an entire year. And I was walking around college like every single day, be like, what's Jack Wilson doing playing third base <laughs> for the Mariners when I could go play? <clears throat> the same level of defense that he is and hit a buck 25 and make the league minimum. Like they'd be paying me less. It'd be a bargain for them. I'm like what's going on? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's so upsetting. That dude forgot how to hit in like such a way he did. Sean Figgins ended his career in Seattle because he forgot how to play baseball. God, that's a name being, I haven't heard in ages after having been a borderline all-star in Anaheim. Jeez. Unreal. What happened? To God, that I have it. That's a flashback name. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, man. He went to Seattle and disappeared because he forgot how to play baseball. That is a thing that happened there. The only guy who I can think of who got to Seattle and was equally as good when he was there and then continued to be great after he left was Gene Segura. Yes. Well, Gene the hitting machine. Segura's base running mistake that cost McCutcheon a season with the Phils notwithstanding. Well, <clears throat> he was never the best base runner, but the dude could hit. He's been, uh, he's been a joy to watch. He's frustrating sometimes, but overall, he's been consistent with the fills, and I have mm-hmm. no complaints about him. Uh, and that's that's always that was always my thing with him is that he was consistent, and you knew he was going to get on base when you need when you needed him to. And actually, he did really well in the leadoff spot a couple times mm-hmm. this season, and maybe that's where it, if they get Marte, that's who's probably going to be leading off. But Gene's just as good. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd be down with either of those guys. Um, but D. Gordon, another guy. Anyway, so <laughs> there's like a list, right? There's a whole list. Anyway, so um, so those are our surprises. You had the Nats. I had the Giants. Was there a letdown? What was your biggest letdown this season? <laughs> the NL East? <laughs> I mean, I, could, was I that, could... It was supposed to be competitive division, right? It was supposed to be the division to watch, and it became... <laughs> it went from must-see TV to like... Saturday night, prime well, no, time so here's that no thing. one cares about. <laughs> it was a division to watch because it was so close. <laughs> you didn't know who was going to win it. I was paying close attention to the NL East at the end of the season because I was like, okay, now everybody's still in this. Nobody's going to win 90 games, but everybody's still in this. They're in the mix here. Here we go. Yeah, Everyone was in the mix because they were that bad. There's, <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying. That's like, what I'm I, saying. I'm legitimately surprised the Braves rode that hot streak to win the World Series. Because that they weren't even over 500 at the trade deadline, which they one tells you the- tells you how bad the Mets tanked, how bad the Phils tanked. Because both of those teams were in first place. I'll beat the Phils for a week and the Mets for most of the first half. Mm-hmm. That and look at the money the Mets spent in the off season to just met the bed and boo their <laughs> own fans. <laughs> And during the season, they spent money to met the bed. <laughs> they continue to do that. Um, so about your fills, though, man. So I think I told you about this, that I went to um, a game where the Phillies were in town here, right? When they're playing the D-backs. Oh, you, and I you went, mean where they took where they lost five of seven to the dude, D-backs? I, they got swept by the D-backs, <clears throat> and I was confused. Um, so I went I went because I wanted to see Bryce Harper play. Like That's specifically why we got those uh, $10 Tuesday tickets for that week because I wanted to watch Bryce Harper. I'm a big Harper fan. And he hit a home run in like the fifth inning, and I looked at Wilson, my son. I was like, well, we can go now if you're ready. <laughs> I came <laughs> and saw what I wanted to see. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but We ended up hanging out for a while. But anyways, now that Phillies team, I think I've said it, Again, I said it before that they, watching them play that game was so weird that there were all these guys, recognizable names, guys who I expected to just like go light this terrible D-backs team up and they couldn't do it. They never got into a groove in that the, game, but it was like you just kept waiting for it to happen, but it never did. They 
they are such a Jekyll and Hyde team. Um, because they can play like contenders against the best baseball teams. And then they just look like the freaking Washington Generals playing the Harlem Globetrotters <laughs> against the absolute worst teams in baseball. Like he's spinning the ball on his finger, just swatted out of his hand. Like, <laughs> sorry. No, I get it. I get it because you know what? So we were talking during the break about how That's such the Mariners a deep came. Simpsons reference, by the oh, way. That's a, good one. that's good. I like that. But so you and I, so for those obviously listening right now, like Jason and I were talking between segments, like during the break, um, about the Mariners, how they came really close to making the playoffs in 2016. But uh, I think it was that year that the Astros lost 100 games. And I'm 99% sure that despite the Astros losing 100-ish games, I think they won the season series against the Mariners that year. A team that was like on the brink of the playoffs just could not beat this terrible Astros team. And that is where my hatred for the Astros comes from. Because it wasn't just that year. It was plus or minus three on both sides. (laughs) <laughs> of of that year and it was just blew my mind absolutely insane it seems like since halliday pitched his no-no against the the marlins in 2010 that the phils have never been able to win a series against the marlins it seems like at least they'll win one and then they'll lose like three like the marlins <laughs> are are the biggest thorn in their side and the marlins are always consistently one of the worst teams in baseball but yeah, which the is weird to me. You think are weird. <clears throat> they are weird. They have their priorities out of whack. That the warm weather teams are not are generally not very good. Uh, even though you'd think that guys would be wanting to go there, right? Like, I don't want to play in snow in in September or in April. Like, why are guys going besides the history and the money? Why are guys going to New York and Boston, when if they go to Miami and they draw every game, they win, they win a lot. They win a few world series. That payroll will go up and it will become a more desirable destination, right? Like it's weird. So odd sidebar. How many, how many lifer twins fans do you think suddenly miss the Metro dome when they're sitting in April and there's snow coming down in the middle of a, of a twins game? (laughs) I honestly, like, <laughs> as, if I was a Twins fan, I would have been furious that they didn't put a retractable roof on that place. Like, even if it's cold, you know, like in Seattle, the retractable roof is different there than it is anywhere else because uh, the D-backs and the Astros and I believe the Marlins, basically, they're and oh, I, and I know the Rangers, but when their roof comes on, it's like it creates like a self-contained box, right? And Seattle, it's literally a retractable umbrella. Because you still have cross breezes that can come through. All it is is it's just a cover. Everything is still open. You can still see out right. into the city. Everything. Um, it's it's just an umbrella. Everything else is a self-contained box. And so I'm surprised that they didn't at least do that in Minnesota. That has always surprised me since they built that stadium. Because you've got to have some protection from the snow in April. <laughs> and probably in September too. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, So in 2016, the... Okay, so the Astros won 84 games that year. But uh, I guess it was 2013 when they lost 111. That's the one that I keep thinking of. But still, I don't think that the Mariners beat them like at all that year because they were terrible. They still, I know the Mariners didn't lose 111 games. They should have been beating them some of that time, but they weren't. But anyway, um, so let down, right? That's where we are? Yeah. My we're biggest letdown, what's that? I said, we're on yours. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. Um, anyway, let's, let's get back on track. Um, so my biggest letdown has got to be the Padres, the San Diego Padres, because we were all expecting them with their pitching and Atis and Hosmer and Machado, expecting everybody to come through and for them to compete with the Dodgers at the very least. I would have expected them to be in the hunt with the Dodgers and Giants for most of the season, you know, instead of feeding into those 108, 109 win seasons that those team had, those teams had. Um, was really disappointed with the way things turned out for them, you know, and some of it was bad luck. Tatis had 
that shoulder injury that that sidelined him for a a considerable amount of time, right? Like he missed he, he missed quite a bit of time, and they ended up moving him out to center field, which kind of made sense. But I was kind of the point that I made. I think it was I think I had Denise on at the time. I was like, a guy who plays that like that doesn't know how to slow down in the outfield. He's still going to die for balls. He's going to crash into the wall. And he's still going to hurt his shoulder. Like you're not protecting well, him. You're putting him in a, in a difficult situation, especially in center field. And moving him to center field exposed some ego issues with him. Well, this is this is the thing is that out and of it's all something the positions, that we talked about when you were last on NASPOD. Yeah, yeah, we it did. And it, I don't think it was so much that as it was um he I mean he was probably frustrated because a guy like that, like He's grown up his entire life, and I'm sure baseball has been easy for him, right? And then for him to go out to center field and not do well, that's got to be really frustrating, you know? So that's going to boil over, like what we talked about on your podcast, about him being frustrated, arguing balls and strikes. And he, Machado, got into it. Machado's like, it's not about you. It's about the team. You know, which, because if he really was, if he did have that big of issues with his personality and had that big of a problem in the clubhouse, he could have straight up told the manager, no, I'm not moving to center field. I am a shortstop. That is where you will play me. He makes enough money. He could have done that. And they could, and, and if they really got into it, they could have said, okay, then we will bench you. We will pay you to sit on the bench. You can come and pinch hit. You can come pinch run because we could use your legs. But I think if it had been that big of an issue and he was really that selfish, that might have been what it came to. But I do feel like center field is the hardest of the outfield positions to play because you're watching the bat come, your ball come straight off the bat, right? Right. That at least in right and left, there's a little bit more leeway that you can kind of tell like which way it's going. On um, in right field and it's a right-handed batter, you know the ball's going to be tailing, so you know to play to your left a little bit, you know, um, based off where you think the ball's going to go. And same thing in left field. But anyway, um, guys who aren't natural outfielders or aren't even natural center fielders struggle at that position at the big league level. D. Gordon did it a couple years ago. The Mariners brought him in, and they said, we think you're athletic enough. You can do it. He couldn't. By the end of the season, Robbie Cano was suspended for PEDs. D. Gordon is back at second base. This year, Jared Kellenick, who is a natural corner outfielder, was put in center field. And there were a lot of growing pains for him for the Mariners. There were a lot of fans like, what's this guy doing? He's terrible. He stinks. Like, well, he's not a natural center fielder. He's a corner outfielder. And the Mariners know that. So they're forgiving those mistakes because just what's going to happen when the guys right. are in the position of the big league level. And so I think we saw that with Tatis. And I think he was frustrated, like I said, because he's one of those guys who baseball has always been easy for him. And I mean, even at the big league level, hitting big league pitching for him has been relatively easy. So I'm sure he was super frustrated by that. But anyway, for me, the, the Padres overall, top to bottom, that was a major letdown. Well, I mean, there we still know that there's clearly issues somewhere in that team because you don't there fire are. the manager as quickly as they did <laughs> unless there's issues in that team. And uh-huh. he just happened to be the guy taking the fall. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they brought in uh, Mob Belvin, Bob Melvin. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Melvin, <laughs> um, and I think I think he's going to turn that thing around. I think they're going to be back contending for the playoffs next year, despite any injuries that we see, because he's done an outstanding job with the A's for a decade. He's done awesome. That's true. That's true. true. All right, um, Jason. For you, biggest moments. What was the biggest moment for you this season? The Phil's finished over 500. I mean, that's there should be a parade right now because I mean, (laughs) um, (laughs) I'm so cynical about my own team. I'm sorry. Um, We all are. We all are. (laughs) And then you let me host a podcast about them once a month. (laughs) And it's fantastic, by the way. Go check out the Philly Baseball Together podcast. He and Tori do an awesome job. Anyway, we definitely deviated about OJ Simpson on the last episode. So. (laughs) I so hard. I don't know how we got there anymore. It's been so long. Um. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, God, Trey Turner had that sweet slide at home against the Phils. Um, 
he looked like he was gliding on air the way he came home on that dude slide. that dude is so smooth <laughs> like that was outstanding that was that was so fun to watch i watched that replay over and over and over again in fact i pulled up that instagram video when i was coaching little league in fall ball and i was like guys this guys this is like when you get really good you might be able to slide like this and I <laughs> like Whoa, that's so cool. I was like, it is cool. He sat and watched like five times in a row. It was like a gif of it, I think, is actually what we watched. But yeah. um as a Phil's fan, it was hard to have big moments to enjoy this year because there weren't a lot of big moments to enjoy this year. Um I mean Harper season alone was was something to enjoy, but it wasn't really a moment. It was it was just a season just continuing to be built upon with just great play. Um yeah, I got nothing because I'm a Phillies fan, man. <laughs> that was an well, awful it, question it is, to ask me. <laughs> it's funny to say that though, because they still finished over 500. Like yeah, they did. And 80. Finally. <laughs> I mean, for me, for me as a Mariners fan, once we hit 80, once the Mariners hit 82 wins, I was like, boom, success, progression. There it is. That's what we want. But really, like for the Mariners this year, though, the the absolute biggest moment. For the Seattle Mariners, I would have to say, uh, came on one of the last few days of the season. Um, you know, the Mariners were were get were in that hunt in the AL wild card hunt for that second spot. Um, which is funny because this team, like, if they had not had such a terrible May and been no hit twice that month, they'd have made the playoffs. They were. Like, I mean, and and they. They were right there. As your friend, it, it hurt me to see them not make the playoffs. <laughs> I appreciate I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Um, but so it was, I got to find out exactly which game it was. Okay, so it was the second to last day of the season, Saturday, October 2nd, um, against the Angels. The Mariners ended up winning that game 6-4, to four, um, but there was a specific play, and this was legit, man, like, legitimately the biggest play of the Mariners season because it, it kept it alive. Like the Mariners were down. Looks like the score was, it was three to four. Okay. Yeah, it was three to four. The angels were up with two outs. And actually this is one of the funny things. You've got former Mariner, Steve Ciszek on the mound facing Mitch Haniger in a full count with the bases loaded. Haniger singles through the second, through the shortstop and third base hole and Jake Bowers and JP Crawford come in and score. The Mariners go up five to four, ended up winning the game six to four. And uh and that other run was was driven in by the very next batter, who happened to be Kyle Seeger, one of his one of the last things he did as a Mariner, um, to seal the deal there. But that moment right there with Mitch Haniger, after everything he's been through the last like three years, he didn't play it all last year because he had a back issue. And then he missed a good chunk of the 2019 season because he fouled the ball off and ruptured a testicle. Like that is a terrible reason to miss baseball. <laughs> like terrible reason That's to miss a anything. Painful reason to miss baseball. Yeah, incredibly. And so, like, like he said that uh, if you haven't seen it, he wrote a great article for the Players Tribune about his struggle coming back and about the team and everything. In fact, I think I will. I'll, Pull it up again. I'll put the link in the description. It should be down there for you now. Um, check it out because it's really good. It is a great article put together by a guy who has always been liked by the fans, but this season got to be a fan favorite because he was the one who stepped up late in the season and was driving in the production that the team needed. Um, Jared Kellen, that came through in September, was the best hitter out of all out of all the rookies in the American League in September, but it was like. He was so low that like going up wasn't really that much, you know, <laughs> it wasn't that right. far to go. But Haniger was the guy who kept this thing going. He was the one of the vocal leaders in the clubhouse, and he's not really known for that. So he's somebody who, like I said, got to be a fan favorite in a really short amount of time after being somebody who was well liked. And this moment right here was like the time that it's like, okay, Haniger is going to be the guy. He's going to be the new captain. He's going to be the one to lead this team to the World Series. And it was because of that moment is outstanding. It was huge for Mariners fans, just enormous. I, I just got to chime in here quick, uh, real personally for me, my biggest moment 
was just going to a game. Yeah. I mean, I, n- no, no hyperbole when I say I got choked up walking into Citizens Bank Stadium. Mm-hmm. That that's my biggest moment as a fan this year was just getting back to a game. Yeah, I think it was for just about all of us. So we kind of lucked out in 2020 because we were down here going to spring training um, literally right before COVID hit. So it was like we got home and then within two days it was all shut down. Like uh, we gave, I specifically remember Wilson and I, my son, we, we gave kind of like a spring training trip report in our first episode back. And previous previously like at the beginning of the episode we were talking about like i mentioned that it felt like the snap from avengers uh infinity war yes because everything was gone you don't know when it's coming back if or when because there's so many unknowns and this year getting to walk into it and then you know we moved down here from idaho we moved down to phoenix and i was like man this is really like upsetting because we live like 15 minutes from jace field so the plan was when we move, let's go to a bunch of baseball games. <laughs> well, we can't, you know. And so, so here we are, here we were this year. Spring training came rolling around again this year, and tickets were so hard to get. We somehow got in the window. We got tickets. We got to go to a spring training game, and my son didn't quite grasp it, you know. Like he had been going to school hybrid, like online then hybrid and everything up to that point. Um. So he so he kind of knew what was going on, but he didn't really it didn't really click. And me walking through the stadium, and I told him I was like I was like Wilson, I was like we have to watch the first pitch. I was like I don't care where, if we're at the playground, I don't care what we're doing. I was like we have to watch the first pitch. He's like okay, Dad, you know. And just like watching that first pitch being thrown live for me, I was like man, like it's unreal, it's crazy. And then Brig was in town, and we and he took me to the game when the Cubs were here. It was right after the All Star break. And it was my first time in a big league stadium since 2015. Wow. So that was awesome as well. That was a really cool thing that like he kind of, so he liked, he wanted to go walk around. I was like, no dude, I just want to sit in my seat. I haven't gotten to watch a regular season big league <laughs> game in a long time. And so he's a little, I could tell he's a little bugged by that, but it was fine. You know, it, it worked out. It was, fun. It, was it was, it was awesome for us. I don't regret, like, I didn't regret rolling our tickets from 2020 into 2021. And I'm so glad I did because we had awesome seats. Um, mm-hmm. I got to take my dad to a game. And he's not a Phillies fan, but he used to go to Phillies games because we're from Pennsylvania. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's cool to take him to his first game at Citizens Bank Park. He's never been there before. That's cool. Um take my daughter for the first time since she was one to a Phil's game. Like that's awesome to see Wheeler pitch a complete game was just like the icing on the cake that day. That's so cool. And I think you're right though. Like I think for a lot of us, that is the biggest moment of the season it was just getting to get back in the stadium, just getting to go after a year of not getting, not being able to, and not really knowing when we were going to again. That it was, and it's something that it's like we didn't realize we needed until we didn't have it. Right. We you took know. it for granted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it was funny too because um, we, you know, we lived in, in Utah and Idaho for a lot of years. And the only time we would go to games is when we went up and visited my dad. And I take that back. It was October 2016. I was at the game when the Mariners got eliminated from postseason contention. In the 2016 season, so oh. I'm sorry that was the last time I went. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> it's a brutal game, but um, but still, I mean, at that point, it had been almost five years, and I had never in my life gone five years between big league games. So that was that was a pretty big deal. It was it was really cool to get back. 